I am pleased to bring you this lecture by Chris Lee from Amicus CGMP. It's for organizations who want to expand their business and need to efficiently scale production. The lecture covers ways to review methods to assess your current capabilities, understand how to determine barriers to scale, evaluate ways to develop a production URS, and learn how to improve systems for implementation and validation. For those of you who would like to follow along with the accompanying PowerPoint presentation, this lecture is also available on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash pharmasalon. The link is in the podcast description for this episode. My name is Christopher Lee, and I am presenting on production efficiency and scale. My background is in, um, in pharma manufacturing, in particular 503B, and I'm a pharmacist by trade. So I've kind of been involved in the compounding industry for quite some time, all the way from the small mom and pops compounder to very, very large scale compounding and manufacturing. Our objectives is to uh, assess, you know, discuss a little bit some of the techniques and mechanisms for assessing your current capabilities as a facility, primarily in terms of you know your production system and what you can uh, what you can do and how you can grow and scale. Determine different barriers to scalability. Develop a production URS, and so really this is just kind of a document or a roadmap that helps you um, grow your business and scale your operation. And then also talk just very briefly about importance of, of validating and, and the implementation of those changes, particularly in a GMP environment. All right, so how can you get to where you want to be if you don't know where, you're, where you are? And this is really, really important. A lot of folks will jump into a new business opportunity before they really assess whether or not it's something they can handle, something that they have even the expertise to, to jump into, and whether or not it even makes sense to do it. Not every opportunity is, is really a great opportunity. So looking first at understanding what your current capabilities are and a way to determine what your costs are in general for your operation, understanding what your limitations are. So one of the first places to start is to look at time studies. And so this is really on the micro level of a time study. It's kind of like process time analysis. So this is where you do observation of your current production system. And this is really going to help you on the costing model side and then also determine whether or not you have the capacity to grow with your with your current processes the way that they are meaning and i say don't don't say grow rather but scale with your current processes so some of the different types of time studies you can do are just getting an understand an idea of what it takes to produce a single sellable unit looking at the different product lines that you have understanding how many total units you can produce within a 24-hour cycle and then in that 24-hour cycle um, how many hours are you actually utilizing and so this gives you an idea of what what capacity your, your facility has currently without any changes, right? So if you look at your personnel, aside from personnel, sorry, you can always add additional personnel to work, multiple shifts, things like that. But in terms of your actual facility with no enhancements, changes to facility equipment, et cetera, this will help give you an idea of what capacity you could theoretically grow into. Post-production time studies, this is really looking at on a GMP side, um, in addition to the production, what does it take to review release batches, the quality components, looking at any associated deviations and investigations to close those out, trying to understand how those impact that release time and that release curve in terms of sellable units and delays. Also testing turnaround time, shipping to your third, a third party contract lab, et cetera. And then also the time to uh, package and ship product. And then you have mini administrative time studies, which is looking again at, because if you do, as you grow your business, you're going to have more documents, you're going to have more batch records, you're going to have more things that need to be routed and, and approved through your change management system. And do you have the, the current capacity to do that? You know, how long does it take on average to, to modify a document and route it with your quality system for approval? And then kind of looking at the macro level, which is something, there's a technique utilized called work sampling. And this is more or less an idea to get, a, to get an idea of what your production system looks like in terms of idle time. And the principles of a, of a work sampling study is that it needs to be very representative, not unlike a clinical trial where the larger the population size you have, the better and the more representative it is. This is kind of what you want to do. The upside to doing these sort of macro time studies or work sampling is that it's, it's not very labor intensive to do that. You're not, you don't have a stopwatch out. What you're doing is you're randomly just showing up to your production, to your, let's say your te te technicians on the floor that are doing production and evaluating sort of binary, right? Yes or no. Are they physically working at that time or are they kind of standing around? And that's not necessarily to identify any individual issues that you have, but more in your production system, are your technicians working all the time or are there, is there a lot of downtime that you have within your system, whether it be transitioning product from one place to the other, 
um, waiting on, you know, quality to maybe release a room, things like that. And so it's, it's kind of, it gives you kind of a high level picture of, of what exactly, what type of efficiency that your facility has. All right. So capacity, capacity is really, you're looking at what your batch sizes are, how many total units you can produce. And it's important that you evaluate your capacity based on 24 seven. So there's, there's one where is what is your current production? What are you producing now? And then your capacity is what you, what you can grow into without any major changes to your facility or adding any equipment, right? It's, it's purely just additional hours, more personnel. So what are you producing? If you're, if you're working your personnel Monday through Friday on a single shift, how do you grow into that facility without any major capital investments, meaning moving to a second shift and then maybe moving to a third shift and then expanding onto weekends, sort of a 24 hour schedule. So understanding what your building is essentially capable of handling from a capacity perspective, notwithstanding the additional personnel requirements that are gonna, gonna be there. And then really quickly just touch on this, larger batches versus more batches, right? That's something to think about when you talk about a scalable process. Kind of understanding costs and analyzing costs, just getting an idea of what exactly it costs to produce a single sellable unit. And this is not just, I see a lot of folks kind of stop at the materials that go into the product, but there's just so much more than that, right? Um, so not only is it, in, is it your inputs and materials, but also the personnel, Again, understanding the time it takes to produce one single unit and the cost of personnel associated with that, including administrative personnel, quality, QC testing, et cetera. Understanding what your testing costs are and wrapping that into um, your sellable units so you understand how those impact um, your per unit costs. Even your utilities for your facility are going to impact right what your potential per unit cost is. And then repair, maintenance of your clean room facility, equipment, et cetera. All of that can be averaged out and fixed, um, added to the cost, right? So you can get a real true understanding of what type of margins you're dealing with um, when you're looking at your products and how growing or scaling your, your business can help reduce these. Looking specifically at, at inputs here, we're talking about raw materials and some ways that you can reduce your costs in raw materials. And I think many of you are already aware of these things, but certainly when you look at your APIs, we're talking about gram per gram, relatively expensive items for the most part. And so one of the ways you can reduce the cost of this and something to look at is just buying in larger quantities and whether it makes sense from a, a commercial perspective to purchase larger quantities or are going to be able to use the product before it go, expires or hits its retest date. Um, and do you have a mechanism in place to, to retest that product and extend the dating on it? Production components, again, all about how many you're buying. So you're, you're looking at discounts for potentially reducing or sorry, increasing your order size and, and reducing the number of times you order, but ordering larger quantities. To get a better per unit price. One of the limitations to that, obviously, on production components is going to be warehousing space. And a lot of the clients that we work with is one of the main things that we see a failure to plan when they're building their facility is, is on the storage, right? Is on the warehousing space. You've got, as you grow your business, you've got finished product that's got to be stored. You've got components that have to be stored and you may be kind of stuck in what you can actually hold on site and how you can reduce costs of, of different components. And then your consumables, like your clean room supplies, QC materials, like your growth media, sample plates, et cetera. Again, a lot of this comes down to the facilities and equipment you have in place and whether or not you have a place to store these items. If they're potentially temperature controlled, you know, need a controlled environment, you're going to have limitations there. So it's just something to consider in your uh, cost analysis of your inputs and how you can modify that. Personnel, of course, would be looking at your production personnel, but not just specifically who's touching units and making units, but also QA quality control, your administrative team. So your leadership, you know, like accounting, HR, all the administration that goes into your business and then your support personnel, uh, whether this be, if you have a contract, contractor cleaning company, or you have personnel that are dedicated to cleaning, warehouse, shipping, et cetera. So there's a lot more than just the technicians that are putting product into the container closure that needs to be evaluated. All right. So facilities and equipment, again, I mentioned utilities before, but also taxes, right? You need to look at potentially if you wanted to isolate the cost of a particular product or process, you could look at um, one of the things you can use to kind of understand the cost per unit when you're breaking down into utilities and taxes is to allocate a production area, right? What percentage of your facility is being utilized to produce that product? And, and then what percentage of time is essentially being utilized to produce that product? And that'll give you an idea of how these different components can feed into your per unit costs. Again, storage is important as well. You may have, let's say, the difference between an IV bag product and, say, a syringe product in, in which you can store a lot more individual units of syringes within a particular area or volume of space, say, in one pallet position than you can of a one liter IV bag. 
And so the the effect, if you will, of the of the cost of that space on that unit is going to be higher, say for an IV bank. And then equipment. So looking at the cost of your equipment and making sure that it's adequately depreciated and then looking at your runtime versus downtime. I and mean, again, so it's important to understand those figures when you're looking at uh, doing a cost analysis for your equipment and what it's doing for you. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about scalability and, and really what this means and, and kind of how to build systems that are scalable. So first we need to understand why, why are we looking to increase or grow our operation? Why are we looking to, to scale? What, what are we trying to do? Are, is there an increased demand for what we're currently offering? Are we trying to just overall improve efficiency of our operation? Are we looking at reducing costs? Are we looking at potential uh, market opportunities? Do we really, really, really understand what it is our customers looking for, what they need? And do we really need to scale, right? Because a huge mistake you can make is starting to implement scalable systems before your business is really ready to do that. For instance, it'd be introducing maybe a very, very expensive automated solution before you, you really, really need to have that automated solution and you've actually kind of grown into your, your capacity without it. Same with, uh, you know, maybe a very robust EQ, EQMS system and whether or not it makes sense to, to move into that type of a scalable system at the, at the time that you're in right now, because those things can be quite expensive and you want to make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. Okay, so just first is kind of understanding what is scalability or what is a scalable process? Because people talk about scalability and they talk about growing as if they're the same thing. And that's really not that's really not the case, right? So when you look at a scalable process and what is scalable, it's really the ability of your process or let's say a component of your process to handle a, an increased volume or increased interaction or contribution by personnel without really having to change it. And so what I mean by that is, let's say if you take a, a document management system that's on a paper-based system where, where you have to fill out a lot of forms and those forms have to change hands from person to person to person, that's not really a scalable process because the more documents you have and the more people that are interacting with that system, um, you, you're going to easily hit capacity and you're going to get to a point where you can't really grow within that space. Whereas an EQMS system that is electronic is really doing a lot of the moving of the paper and it's all about just licenses and logging in. And that's a scalable process, right? A small operation and a very, very large manufacturing facility can both operate on the same QMS system if it's, you know, electronic, right? So are all process scalable? No. Are all products scalable? No. Particularly in the 503B space, when we're, when we're talking about, let's say, sterile to sterile compounded processes versus a bulk API to, to a sterile finished product process, you, as many of you know in your experience, the sterile to sterile processes are, are generally not scalable or very difficult to grow into very large batch sizes with those with those products, right? Because it's all very very manual, and the only way to really make more product is to have more people and have more hoods. It's very difficult to run batch sizes that can reach what you can get if you're producing product from bulk, and then the rate limiter is really just the filling of the product rather than having to actually compound these individual units in a sterile to sterile manner. So what are the primary gaps to scale? And this is really what everyone needs to understand when they're looking at growing their business or, or scaling their, their operations or developing a scalable operation. And that is, these, these are primary functions of that, is personnel, is a potential huge gap. Not necessarily who do you have right now, but who can you get? Or is your facility in a location or in an area where you have access to a qualified labor pool. A lot of facilities are in areas that are not particularly filled with people who are qualified to do this type of work or can easily be trained or have the education experience, et cetera. And, and decisions like that are made to save cost on buildings and you know whether it be building or taxes or whatever reasons, there's various, many reasons for a business to choose to kind of be in the middle of nowhere. But one of the things that happens when you do that is you don't have access to, the, to, to personnel. And so it becomes very difficult to grow your business. If you're a 503B looking for more content on improving your business systems, check out our episode on blockchain for the 503B supply chain. Infrastructure. So this would be looking at your current facility. Does your facility have that space, right? You, you may have a ton of clean room space that you can scale with, that you can, you can do large batches with. But if your warehouse space, if it was a, if it was a afterthought, then you have no place to put everything you're making. You have no place to order the additional components you need to, to do larger batches and to reduce your costs. So that's really, really important. Also systems, do you have an EQMS system or are you in 
fully in a paper-based quality management system that's very labor intensive. Again, understanding that there's nothing wrong with that. And in some cases we encourage clients that we work with to stay with a paper system because one of the things you lose when you go to an electronic system is you lose flexibility, right? So you may increase some efficiency, but in the very beginning when you're, when you're growing very fast and you have to make things happen very quickly, you tend to lose some of that flexibility when you're an electronic system. So understanding whether that is a true gap, whether or not you can overcome that. Funding, that's, everyone knows that. Everyone's dealt with this in any facilities. I used to run production facilities and cash flow is, is key, right? When you're looking at growing or you can't, you, you can't add um, scalable systems, you can't add, you can't grow, you can't add personnel if you don't have some funding to make that happen. And then marketing and sales, right? So does it make sense when you're building your operation, when you're growing your operation, do you have the ability to, to reach into that market and to make it sort of worth scaling? Or are you going to build a, a situation where you're, you're producing a lot of product and then you're, you're burning it when it's hitting X3 because you're not able to move it? And, and, and are you targeting the right customer, right? It's certainly when you're looking at a, a large scale operation or you're increasing your scale, do you want to, do you want to sell one box of 10 units to thousand customers or would you rather sell your entire batch to one customer? All right. So, so just understanding a, a URS, it's really, it applies primarily that terminology is applied primarily to like customized automated equipment or thing or software where you're building a user requirement specification. In this case, if you're, if you're truly under wanting to scale your business or grow your business, it's important to write all this stuff down, right? And really, really analyze it. Make sure that you understand where you are, that you understand where you want to be. Or otherwise, you could just be heading in the wrong direction, thinking with good intentions that you're, you're moving in the right direction, but it's not truly solving your problem. So are you looking to, again, understanding what the goal of this, of this growth is or the scalability you're trying to do or the increase in efficiency? Is it, are you trying to get more output of, put of current products? Are you trying to add new products? Are you trying to reduce the cost or increase the efficiency, right? And then building that into a document that becomes the roadmap and sort of guide to, to move forward is so, so important rather than just kind of thinking of things and, and making a decision on the fly without really doing some comprehensive analysis. And then again, one of the things that you never, ever, ever want to do, particularly in a GMP environment, is you're never sacrificing quality to gain efficiency, right? You're never going to, you're never going to implement or develop a system that says, okay, let, let's say in a paper-based system, for instance, you know, well, if we can cut five of these steps out and how we review this documentation or review this batch record, we can release batches faster. Well, if those steps are there for a reason and they increase the quality of the product, even though, and provide an additional set of checks and balances, that's not some, that's not a place you want to skim, right? Okay, so understanding the assessment and closing the gaps is really what you're doing with your URS, right? So you've kind of analyzed where you're at, what your capacity is, what your costs are. You've determined what your potential gaps are to to that growth plan or what you're trying to do. And then when you write this URS, when you write this master document, you're basically trying to understand how you're going to close the gaps. It's really your plan. So or do you need new leadership? What new leadership positions you need? What level of qualification, experience, education do they need? Do you have a, a culture internally for growth? Having worked with lots of um, different operations from small to very, very large operations, if your company is not, does not have a culture for change and growth and working sort of a fast-paced environment that's constantly evolving, that can be a huge challenge, right? If they're all very comfortable doing what it is that they, they do on a day-to-day -day basis, basis, are you going to put them in a position where they're very, very uncomfortable now having to do new things, maybe having to work slightly longer hours, et cetera? You need to be able to understand whether you need to make changes from a culture perspective in your organization before you implement these things. Understanding if there's any infrastructure requirements that you have in closing those, again, we talk about EQMS because it's all, it's probably one of the easiest ways that you can get a lot of bandwidth from your quality uh, uh, group by implementing a system like that. Looking at inventory management, very, very important. Adding equipment, potentially automated equipment that's going to help you be more efficient and, and that is scalable, right? So we talk about automated equipment is generally very, very, very scalable. People are, are not. And then facilities, do you need to, you need to enhance your current facility, for instance, is, is a new product that you're going to be potentially implementing require a different set of engineering controls, right? So you need to increase the robustness of your facility um, or do you need to expand? And primarily there, what I'm talking and where I see the failure the most is in warehouse space, the expansion of warehouse space. 
And then marketing and sales. What's your what's your growth plan? What's your strategy? What type of personnel are you going to require to to make it so that it's worth it for you to make all these changes? All right. So major components of the plan. Cost. We talked about how important funding is and understanding this is is key, right? So what is the cost of all these different components? And then what is your timeline? And it's important that you build a um, a very detailed project plan of what all these lead times are. And that's going to help you balance some of when capital investment needs to be made and make it so that folks aren't writing big, massive checks for whether it be facilities or equipment before it's necessary. I mean, you're basically draining your cash flow either too early or too late, right? I mean, to be in a scenario where um, if you don't plan out properly, you're adding on all this capacity potentially on, let's say, a warehousing side, but you're not properly timing when equipment's going to come online. So now you have all this space that can be used and a, and a bunch of people sitting around waiting for, let's say, an automated filling system to be up and running rather than trying to get all of that to time out where it's coming online at the same time and you're, and you're working in a very efficient way. If you never put this down on paper, if you never build a plan, you're going to miss your targets all the time. And I should say you're, you're probably going to miss targets even when you plan. Um, but without a plan, it's, it's guaranteed to happen. And those, those misses are going to be much, much larger. All right. So implementation and validation. All right. So just understanding this is the most, probably the most important part from a quality perspective and from a GMP compliance perspective is understanding what these changes in your production system, your increases in scale, whether it be construction or whether it be implementation of, of some sort of a, uh, infrastructure, electronic system like EQMS or um, automation, what is it going to do to your current production system and and how does it impact that, right? So are we talking about we have to make a facility change that's going to that's gonna impact our current production where we can't make product for a particular amount of time? How are we going to get ahead of that? Are we going to produce additional lots, work extra hours for the weeks prior to that downtime so that we, we have extra inventory to sell? You need to look at, again, what type of loss and flexibility we're going to have if we implement some sort of automated electronic system? Do we have any skills or talents gaps, right? You may have a ton of great technicians working for you, but, but none of them have ever worked with an automated system before. And so there's going to be some gaps that, that are going to be there. Do you have even, you know, mechanical, potentially access to mechanical engineering company or a mechanical engineer on site? When you add automated systems, while they are great and they are very efficient and they can certainly improve your ability to grow as a business, they come with a whole separate set of challenges, right? And are you prepared to overcome that? Um, lead time delays, you may identify a potential new product or process and, and need some sort of a single use disposable assembly, which theoretically is gonna save you a lot of time on the validation side, but are there supply chain issues? This is something we ran into with a few of our clients that were using a, a disposable customized system and company where lead times are normally four weeks for these custom systems, it, it turned into six to nine months. And, you know, you could very easily be in a situation, um, and sometimes it's unforeseeable, but very easily be in a situation where you're, everything's ready to go. You've made all the investments, you have all the automation, you have all the people, but you just can't get the supplies. And, and those things happen, unfortunately. Um, and then any vendor related delays, right? So you've got to qualify your vendors in a GMP facility. Maybe you need to test, you're going to have a new product you're going to bring online and there's delays from your contract lab and validating that product. So keys to success here in implementing the systems and growing is really robust project management. I mean, if you are trying to take it to the next level and compete on a very high level of, of scalability and output, it's, it's important that you look into a, having a project manager or working with a company that can help you with project management. And this individual really has to understand what they're doing. They have to be detailed and consistent. And they have to make sure they're working with the right people to make those decisions. Understanding how to manage your budget, very important, right? So make sure you always create a buffer in your budget for unforeseen costs. Understanding what that could be, basically looking at what your cost is and maybe adding uh, potentially 5 to 10% to what your budget is to cover any issues that might occur. And issues are going to occur. Technicians are going to make mistakes when they're formulating new products and have machines that are down, things are going to get broken. This is just the way is and then understanding to communicate changes in the timeline very very fast what i say is kind of fail fast i know people don't like to fail but failures are going to occur uh, particularly in the r d phase and, and the faster you can get to a point where you fail the faster you, you can correct it or sorry create a system that prevents failures let's let's put it that way uh and then mitigate knowledge and personnel gaps so one of the things you can look at again is is there a possibility to work with consulting or staff augmentation to allow you, if you are in a place where you don't have access to skilled and qualified individuals, 
and kind of labor pool is a little looking a little bleak, there, there are certainly ways that you can you can fill those gaps very, very quickly. And then validation and compliance again. Any of these changes, they have to go through change management. That takes time. It's important to to look at your impact analysis on your quality of your products in the validated state of your product and processes, understanding how to validate and qualify new processes and personnel and equipment. And as always, document, document, document. It's just so important that this component happens. People tend to pull the trigger really fast on on automation, equipment, et cetera, but they don't properly route it through their system. And it can get really, really easy to do that and kind of take things out of the, the, the real flow through your quality system when you're trying to do things really, really quickly and, and manage this growth and, and enhance your facility, but also still trying to run your facility at your current capacity, right? Because you don't want to, you don't want to lose production and lose opportunity. All right. So that is that. Let me jump into questions real quick. So this is true or false in today's market, compounding facilities should take every opportunity presented to them. This is somewhat of an opinion and I didn't get a chance to touch on it too much, but no, right? I mean, false. Now it might seem like you want to take the opportunity that's presented to them, but I can tell you from experience that generally speaking, when you go into a facility and they're offering 400, 500, 600 SKUs, there's going to be some serious quality issues that are associated with a, with a, with a small facility trying to operate. I mean, even a large GMP facility is not going to be able to offer 400 or 500 different products and maintain a, a decent quality. So it's going to be very, very, very challenging, right? So it's about identifying the right opportunities. It's not about taking every single opportunity that comes to you. Because when, when you do that, you, you might, you know, you have to evaluate opportunity costs. In many situations, it would always be better if you could just make, if you could make a lot more of, of something you already make and sell every bit of it rather than making 500 things. True or false, if you've been uh, making a product for years, scaling up a production does not require any further validation. And that's mostly false. Obviously, if you're going to scale or add automation to your process, that needs to be validated. Major changes in batch size need to be addressed through some level of validation um, if you haven't already covered that in previous validation, particularly say media fills, for instance, um, you can't, you can't go from making a hundred, a batch size of a hundred to a batch size of 5,000 without making some change in validation. So that, that is all I have to go ahead and wrap up. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email, kle at amicusgmp.com and we can set up a call and just to have any discussions or if you have any questions about this presentation or subject matter. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you for listening. At Pharma Salon, we produce content and conferences for the compounding pharmacy industry that focuses on learning through conversation. It is our mantra that everyone's experience is worth hearing and can benefit someone else in the industry, and we're the ones to facilitate those discussions. Check out our website, pharmasalon.com slash compounding for updates on our latest events. We're introducing podcasts for CE credits. Subscribe on your favorite podcast player for updates on our latest episodes.